Happy Sabbath, brethren. It's so good to see all of you on Zoom this morning and to hear all that chatter. Uh, we've had quite a bit of rain here in South Florida, and not coincidentally, I guess, I was actually reading the Noah flood account. Not that I think we're going to flood or wash away here, but I was reading in um, an illustrated Bible um, cultural background study Bible about the flood. And there are other flood accounts throughout the world. And in one of the flood accounts, there was a mention of other gods. And so these are man-made gods, and these gods rule over different aspects of people's lives. There's the god of the hills and the god of the rivers. And anyway, the gods were discussing... Um, how they were disappointed with mankind and they were going to wipe them out with a flood. And it, it was not exactly an, uh, unanimous. There was, there was one God that decided he had a favorite human. He didn't want him destroyed by this flood. And so he leaked information about this plan and also gave him information about how to uh, keep the leak secret. So he was able to create a boat secretly. He was able to survive the flood. And so he was the last surviving human after this flood, uh, him and, and whoever was on his boat with him. And the other gods were angry with um, with the fact that this information had leaked out and that there was someone that had survived. So, you know, there are in ancient cultures all of these stories about these man-made gods that they've had. During the exodus out of Egypt, the Israelites um, witnessed God punishing the Egyptians with ten different plagues. Each one of these plagues actually attacked an Egyptian god. And so, uh, again, you know, little g, just these are, these are made up gods. These are not real uh, divine spirits like the god that we worship, like the godhead that we worship that is real, active in our lives, um, and certainly beyond anything uh, man-made. They don't need men. They don't need men's worship or adoration. And so the Israelites got to witness God, the real God, punishing the Egyptian gods, taking them down one by one, showing everyone, the Egyptians and the Israelites, that the Egyptian gods were false and had no real power. A lot of cultures are polytheistic. Polytheistic means believing in a plurality of gods. The Greeks, the Romans, even the Hindus today have gods for different things. There's the land gods, the ocean gods, the rivers and the hills. Can you imagine trying to go to the feast and having these um, maybe an airline god that you would have to somehow honor, worship, uh, appease, to be able to get good seats, um, good prices. You know, you wouldn't want to be seated next to a crying child, right? Um, especially the entire flight. Or maybe somebody that's sick, that's sitting right next to you and coughing and sneezing and touching everything, <laughs> sitting right next to you on the plane. And then you get to your destination, there's the taxi gods, there's the hotel gods. Uh, the hotel gods, you know, you would pray to them to ask for a good hotel room close to your friends, away from the people smoking ganja and the, the Friday night partiers. And, and what if some of these gods liked you but other gods didn't and they would argue over whether or not you would have a good vacation or a good feast? I really don't want to think about it. So I want to ask you a question. Are you monotheistic or are you polytheistic? Something to think about. The most sacred prayer in all of Judaism is called the Shema, and it comes from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you can imagine, again, this is given in Deuteronomy. This was given to the Israelites. 
they are contrasting this with the many polytheistic gods of Egypt. From this verse, they teach that the Lord is eternal, he is self-existing, he's an everlasting one, he is the one that truly exists. This verse is recited every morning. It, it reminds them that their God was the only God. Now, some scholars think that this means that there's only one God being. Again, monotheistic. But where does this belief lead someone who feels that there can only be one God being? It leads to a belief in the Trinity. Because if you read your entire Bible, and not just this one verse, and especially the New Testament, but there are scriptures in the Old Testament as well, you can see that there are more than one God being. You have in Genesis uh, 1, you, say, you have the verse about, let us make man in our image. That's certainly plural. We'll also look at a verse in Psalm a little bit later. In the Old Test, I mean, I'm sorry, in the New Testament, we have so many verses that we're going to cover today about the Father and the Son and how they're both God beings. And so if you're trying to reconcile the Bible saying that there's more than one God being with a monotheistic viewpoint, how do you fit that together? And again, it leads people to a belief in the Trinity, a three in one being. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and then they also weave the Holy Spirit into this as well. We, as a church, do not believe in the Trinity. We believe that they are actually uh, two separate beings, God the Father, Jesus Christ his Son, and the Holy Spirit is their essence, it's their nature, it's their power. It is not a separate being. Going back to this verse, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, looking at that word one, does this word only mean the number one, that the Lord our God is singular? If we look here at the original Hebrew, um, echad might be how it's pronounced. I, I do have the uh, phonetic... Um, suggestion there of how this is supposed to be pronounced. Um, ek odd, ek odd. I'm going to go with that. That's as close as I can get from looking at it. This is Strong's uh, H258. And some of the other ways in which this word is translated. So now this word, this Hebrew word, is actually used 968 times in the Old Testament. And it is not always translated as the word one. Sometimes it's translated as united. Other times, alike, or all together, or together. So it can mean something other than simply the number one. Let's take a look at another example. So this is a compound unity word. Let's look at the example in Judges 20. Judges chapter 20, looking at verses 1 and 2. Uh, not giving you the background here. There's, um, there's obviously a battle about to occur. Let's take a look at how the children of Israel are coming together. So in Judges 20, verse 1, So all the children of Israel came out, from Dan to Beersheba, as well as from the land of Gilead. And the congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord at Mitzvah. Mitzvah. And so I've highlighted that. It's in bold. One. That's the same Hebrew word. Obviously, it does not mean the number one in this case. Something else is going on here. Continuing on in verse 2. And the leaders of all the people, all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the, of the people of God, 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. So we don't know when it says all the children of Israel came out, we don't know how many that is, but we do know that there was at least 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. That's not the number one. 
continuing on, trying to get some context here of what, how we can actually give meaning to this word. In Judges 20 and verse 8, So all the people arose as one man. They arose united. They, re, they arose together. They arose with the same purpose. Not only one man standing up. So all the people arose as one man, saying, None of us will go to this tent or turn back from his house. Skipping down to verse 11. So Judges 20, verse 11. So all the men of Israel were gathered together against the city. Notice the context. United together as one man. So we can learn from this, this passage here, that many can be treated as one if they are united in purpose. Our Godhead is not just one God being, but since they are united, they can be referred to as one. Now, I just use that word Godhead. I think that uh, should be commonly understood, but we talk about it as the God family, where God is the family name. And so just like Lockhart is a family name, so there's Jeff is in the family, Benjamin is in the family, Elise is in the family, Adriana's in the family. They're all Lockharts. And there are times that we're, we are one, <laughs> that we are together, united in purpose. Not as perfectly as the Father and the Son are united. So now that we see the context here, we can see how this word is translated in other passages. We can see the context that someone, that you, uh, an army united in purpose could be counted as one. Let's go back and look at Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 and look at other valid translations of this verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is unified. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is as one. So I want to discuss today the oneness of God, the unity that is being described in this verse, and why it's also important for us to focus on this daily, daily. The concept of more than one God was well known to Old Testament scriptures. Uh, Old Testament writers and readers. Again, I reference Genesis 1, Genesis chapter 1. Let us make God in our image. How would you make sense of that in a monotheistic world where there's only one God being? Again, I guess you could, um, you could use the Trinity as an example, but if it's a three in one being, why would they be talking to each other? The Trinity um, has no basis, no scriptural basis. So it's, I, I don't even want to try to pretend on how that thought process would work, but it makes much more sense, as we'll see here, the Father and the Son. Psalm 110 and verse 1 also covers this. In Psalm 110, verse 1, it says the Lord, and this is in the original, was Y-H-W-H, what is referred to as the Tetragrammaton. This is representing the eternal, God the Father. And then it says the Lord said to my Lord, and the second one is Adonai, which is a sovereign ruler or master, later to be known as Jesus the Christ. So the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So we can see from this verse, that there's two different beings being talked to. One being is speaking to another. We can also see that there's authority here. They're giving the instructions. My Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So someone has authority here over the other. Now, looking forward again into the New Testament, the book of John takes a very deep look at the life of Jesus. And he wrote this book to address a controversy that was coming into the church about the nature of Jesus. Some were saying that Jesus was not a divine being, but that he was a creation of the God of the Old Testament. 
So there's two main points to the book of John. One, he wants to discuss and to define very, very clearly that Jesus is a God being. Second of all, he wants to address the relationship between Jesus and the Father. <laughs> and he does this very thoroughly. There are over 90 verses in the book of John describing the relationship between Jesus the Christ and God the Father. It starts in the very first verse. In John chapter 1, verse 1, this should be a memory scripture. It's one that we use often in sermons. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So, once again, we have two beings here. And the Word was God. So the Word was with God, a God being, and the Word was also God. So we have in the very first verse of John chapter 1 that there are two God beings. The Godhead exists, and it, can, and, ex, and it consists of more than one being. If we move down to verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we learn from this verse that the Word, which was a God, became flesh. And then the, the other thing that we learn from this is the family relationship as a father. And we all have a father in our lives somewhere. Whether or not we have a relationship with that father is another story. So where there is a son, there has to be a father. Where there is a father, there has to be a son. Um, there was uh, a joke I read recently. A school teacher asked the student, and I'll, I'll say if this was Benjamin here, if they asked Benjamin, um, how old is your father? And as it turns out, I actually had a birthday yesterday. Benjamin could honestly say that I was 20 years old. Would that be correct? Well, I've only been a father for 20 years when Adriana was born. So I was... I was a human, I was a man before that, but I was not a father, and I've only been a father for 20 years. Okay, so we have this father-son relationship. Let me ask you a question. Who was the God of the Old Testament? Who was that person, or that being, I should say, that spoke to Abraham? Who was that being that Moses wanted to see when he was up on the high mountain? He said, I want to see your glory. Who was that? Well, if we continue in the book of John here, for chapter 1, in verse 18 it says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So... Okay, no one has seen God at any time, but we do know that there were people in the Old Testament that saw someone who claimed to be the great I Am. Moses, in the burning bush, spoke to the great I Am. In John 5, in verse 37, there's a, another passage here. It says, And the Father himself, who sent him, has testified of me. You have neither, neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. Now, this is sometimes used to say that no one has ever seen the Father, and no one has heard the Father. I want to point out in Matthew 3.17, so we're going to go just take a sidetrack here for just a second. In Matthew 3.17, this setting the scene here, this is when Jesus was baptized. And as he was baptized, and suddenly a loud voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay, so if Jesus is a God, Jesus was the Word that was made, fle uh, that was made flesh, and the you know so the God um, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was um, was God. If Jesus was a God that became flesh, he's not speaking to himself here. <laughs> so this is that second God being. This is God the Father that is saying, "This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased." So. Some people have, not every, those that were there at Jesus' baptism 
have heard God, did hear God's voice. Um, other people that may, uh, that Jesus was speaking to at a later time in uh, John 5, 37, they weren't there at the baptism, so they didn't hear God's voice. So just to clear that up, but the number of people that have heard God's voice is a very limited number. Okay, so let's go back and think about this. Because I posed the question, I do want to answer it, who was the God of the Old Testament? If no one in the Old Testament saw God the Father, and if only at Jesus' baptism someone has heard the Father's voice, who did they hear thundering on the mountain there when Moses and the Israelites were in the wilderness? Well, that is answered for us in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. I wanted to point this out because some try to contrast, compare and contrast. They try to create a difference between the God of the Old Testament as being harsh and judgmental, and, the, and Jesus in the New Testament as bringing only love and mercy and grace. But if you really look at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4, they're one and the same person. The people that the Israelites followed, the ones that, the God that, the God being that would open up the earth um, and strike down those that were being rebellious against Moses and God, that was Christ. That was the rock they followed. That was Christ. There is no difference. They are one and the same person. Jesus said to the crowd that was gathered, and they did not like this, but he said, before Abraham was, I am. So he, Jesus is the one that we read about most often as God in the Old Testament. Obviously, we read Psalm 110 earlier, where uh, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord. So it wasn't only Jesus that is discussed in the Old Testament, but he is the one that is there most often. Going back to the book of John, John 17 and verse 26, and in this I'm going to use the New Living Translation, because I mentioned earlier that part of the purpose of Jesus Christ coming to earth was to reveal the Father. He had to reveal him because the God that they knew was Jesus the Christ. The God that they knew of the Old Testament was mostly Jesus the Christ. So Jesus had to come to reveal the Father. And we see this in John 17, verse 26, and again using the New Living Translation. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love will be for me in them, and I will be in them. In John 10 and verse 30, I and my Father are one. So this is almost, this is almost the New Testament equivalent to Deuteronomy 6.4, where I and my Father are one. Once again, the question is, are we talking about the number one? That is, again, is there some trinity going on here, the three and one? No. What Christ is saying in John 10 and verse 30 is, I and my Father are united. We are unified in purpose. So they're two different beings, not one in number, but one in unity, one in essence. Once again, the book of John has over 90 verses that talk about their unity. When you read the book of John and you read through those 90 verses about the unity and, and take the Bible as a whole, you can see that God the Father and Jesus Christ have shared eternity. They have the same goals. They use the same approach. They work the same work. They think the same thoughts. They speak the same words. They honor each other. They glorify one another. They witness to one another or of one another. They both speak pure truth. They are inseparable. They never work independent from one another, and they're always in agreement. 
in a lot of ways, they are identical. It is very hard to tell the difference between them because they have so many similarities. They're not like those fake gods that I mentioned in my introduction that fight with each other, that have cross purposes, that will sneak around and lie and, and leak information and break confidences. You know, those fake gods have very limited areas of authority, the hills or the rivers. We see that the God that we worship is eternal. It, it, they are universe or, I, I, yeah, universe in authority, uh, universal authority, and they never fight. They are unified in purpose. So we saw earlier that Jesus revealed the Father. How did he do this? Did he teach a class? Okay, my father. Let me tell you about my father. Point number one. Um, he didn't do any Zoom meetings. <laughs> no, he revealed the Father by his living example. Father and son were so identical that if you saw one, you saw the other. That's exactly what he told Philip. When Philip wanted to see the Father, Jesus said, uh, have you not seen me? <laughs> because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've been with me and you know me, then you know the Father. This is how deep their unity and oneness goes. So at this point in my sermon, we've talked through, we've proven that there are two separate, distinct God beings in the God family. And we're actually being called to be part of that family. This is, this is the great truth about the oneness of God that actually gets lost in the Trinity. You know, the Trinity is a three in one. It's a closed circle. And no one can join that Trinity. But with there being two beings in the God family, being distinct, it opens up the possibility for more people to be joined into that family. We cover this in Pentecost when we talk about God giving his Holy Spirit to the church in the Old Testament and now giving it to us at baptism with the laying on of hands. God actually gives a seed, a down payment to us. His Holy Spirit living in us makes us heirs to his family, sons and daughters in his kingdom. That's what we're being called to be part of, is part of this family. Now, who's going to be in this family? I'm sure you have a, somewhere along the way, you've had a BFF. You've had a best friend. Do you and your best friend always agree on everything? Or has there come a time where there's been disagreements? Even in families where everybody is called by the same name, even then there's the possibility of disagreements. I would like to say that I have lived perfectly in harmony with my family. That would not be true. And please don't ask them for stories, okay? <laughs> but that would not be true. So we're being called into this family. I did ask the question, who's going to be in that family? And I'll answer that in just a moment. But how is it, how is it that Jesus and God have been able to live together throughout eternity? That's a long time. Um, how long can you stay in the same room with some of your relatives? But the Father and the Son have lived in oneness for eternity. How is that possible? Well, the Bible tells us that two cannot walk together unless they be agreed. But there's more to this. There is authority. We've already read back in Psalms 110 where the Yahweh said to Adonai, sit at my right hand. There was authority. And for authority to work, because I'm sure all of us have lived under some authority. Uh, we have bosses at some point. Everybody has a boss. Um, at some point, someone, in this case Adonai, had to submit to the authority of Yahweh, the YHWH. 
So we have submission to authority. Why do people submit? A lot of people submit because of fear. Um, they're afraid they may get fired, or it's a bully that's threatening. Some people submit out you know, of lust for money or they want power, and so they submit now, but they're going to get theirs later. Is that why Christ submits to the Father? No. Christ submits because he loves the Father. He submits because he loves the purpose that the Father and he have worked out to bring more people into the family. The scriptures show us that Christ submits to the Father out of love, faith, and trust. Christ loved us enough that he was willing to submit to torture and even death for us. That's the love that he had. That's the reason he submits is out of love. He had faith in the Father that the Father would not only resurrect him, but to give Christ the honor and glory and the privileges that he had before he became flesh, that he was going to be able to sit at the Father's right hand. Was there a time when Christ didn't submit to the Father? I can't find it in the Bible. From the foundation of the world, they have been united in purpose. They have been one. So, this oneness again. What did Jesus have to say about their oneness? If we go back and look at the book of John, we'll see these quotes. He said, the Father sent me. There's authority, there's submission to the authority, there's oneness of purpose. I didn't come to do my will, but the will of the Father. The words that you hear from me are from my Father. The works that I do, they are my Father's. As the Father gives me commands, so I do. And the Father is greater than I. Was the Father greater in power? Not that we know of. They're both made out of the same essence, the same Holy Spirit. But the Father was greater in authority because Christ was willing to submit to that authority so that the two could walk together in unity. The rest, um, I'm sorry, this oneness has been extended to us. I asked the question, who's going to be in the family? We just returned from the Feast of Tabernacles. In the Feast of Tabernacles, we covered the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. He's going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's going to have authority. The world is going to have to submit to that. And then we covered the eighth day where there's going to be that final judgment and those that don't choose to submit, those that don't recognize God authority, God's authority, will be cast into the lake of fire. And what will be left will be a new heaven and a new earth where God the Father comes down to earth to dwell with man for eternity. And as they pick who's going to be in eternity, it's not going to be people that want to bicker, that want to sow discord, that are bringing disunity into the family. It's going to be those that are seeking the oneness of mind, the oneness of purpose. The scriptures tell us we need to put on the mind of Christ, to let Christ live in us, to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. And so that's who's going to be included in that family that family relationship, those that want to be at one with God. So we need to ask ourselves, do we have that oneness now? And this is why I said we need to focus on this daily. Wake up in the morning. You know, the, in Judaism, they recite Deuteronomy 6, 4 on a daily basis. And we should wake up every morning saying, I want to be at one with you, Father, I want to be at one with you, Christ, and I want to be at one with my family, my church, my neighborhood, and my community. I want to find that unity of purpose. I want to be a peacemaker. And when we see disunity in the body of Christ, ask yourself honestly, am I part of this division? Am I causing this? 
1 Corinthians 1 and verse 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Very important question asked in verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? So I want us each now to stop and examine ourselves. Are, is Christ divided? You know, are there divisions? Do you ever say, well, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Jeff, or I'm of Chuck? There's no divisions. Christ is not divided. I am of Dominica, or I am of Jamaica. We're all united in purpose, following the teachings of Jesus Christ and his Father. Just because they're one, we need to be at one with them and with each other. So what does it say in 4 John 6, verse 4? Now, you might have trouble finding uh, the fourth book of John in your Bible, but would this be a true statement? Hear, O Caribbean, the people of our church, the church is one. <laughs> okay, again, I just, that's not in your Bible. That should actually be a true statement. Hear, O Caribbean, the people of our church, the church is one. It's not, but it needs to be a goal that we work towards. We need to work, and when we find divisions, we need to mend those fences. We need to fix it. We need to become one. Here's the key. Just like God the Father and Jesus the Son are able to walk together in agreement, and one has authority and one submits to that authority, here's how we can fix divisions in the church. 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Now, if we look through verses 1 through 5, we'd see a lot of submit one to another, um, different people being told to submit, but it includes us all. Continuing on here, it says, Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with hum humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humbleness, submission to one another, will allow us to have that unity of purpose, that oneness. We have to control ourselves. It starts with our thoughts. So what do we need to be doing? We need to be humble. And why? I've answered that. Because we want to be in the family. And the only people that are going to be in that God family are those that submit to God's authority to his will, and that we all work together with oneness of purpose. You know, I mentioned last week uh, in the sermonette that I did with the newscast, we talked about a potential coming civil war to America. A country as strong as, to, as America is hard to attack from the outside. And if you want to bring the country down, it's much easier to create and to cultivate and to support divisions within and allow the country to destroy itself. If we're united, the Bible tells us that a, three, a three, um, threefold cord is not easily broken. So if we're united together in purpose, it's going to take a lot to divide us. But just like the United States, as mighty as it is, can be brought down by internal divisions, so can the church. The church can fail and fall apart if Satan is allowed to create divisions and to separate us from one another, if we're not united in purpose. Continuing on in the book of John, John 17, 22, And the glory which you gave me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. So anything short of oneness, un un unity, um, a united purpose, anything short of that is not what is going to get into the kingdom. It's not what Christ is looking for. Christ and the Father 
they're wanting people in their family that want to have the same relationship that they already have. So I'm going to leave you with this, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 once again. And think about this daily. Think about the things that we've covered today. Think about how you can humble yourself, submit, how you can help grow the unity in your family, in your church, in your community. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one.